but before we we dig into kind of more talking I, i'd like to get um davi's kind of take on everything here so uh yeah let's bring up those those slides let's let's see what you've got to say Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm Davi. I'm Head of uh, Customer Success at 2057. Now, we're a software development house, and we've got two low-code products called Lynx and Stadium. And um, one of our primary focuses is to integrate systems. Now, we've been empowering uh, DevOps with enterprise-grade low-code tools now for over 20 years. And through these years, we've learned more and more about what we really needed to, you know, to do a job. And in 2016, we've launched links to the public and allowing them as well to then start to, to build and consume API, um, APIs. Now, as a developer and a low-code user, one of my favorite questions people ask me is, uh, can you? So can you build this? Can you connect to that? Can you integrate with this? And through these questions, we've been building up a very nice um, stack of GitHub examples of, yes, <laughs> through low-code, you can connect to these systems and integrate products, et cetera, et cetera. So please, whenever you do see me, uh, just ask me, uh, can you? So today, I want to have a quick talk about low-code, microservices, REST APIs, SOAP APIs, and how all of this comes together. In the last 20 years or so, APIs have become a huge part of any system. Um, when we talk about APIs, it can be just about anything. However, no two APIs are alike, and everyone is using their own standards, their own formats, the same with microservices. So what brings this all together um, at the end? And it's, it's your end goal. What do you want to accomplish? That's what brings all of this together. Now I'm going to take you through a quick example of how two completely different systems can talk to each other using low code and also some common pitfalls uh, of working with low code. So, but first, what is low code? So, for us, low code is the ability to build complete, complex, and usable solutions without having to write code. Now, this is a bit different than no code, as in with low code, you, you are still using programming principles and logic. You've still got your ifs and your whiles, your SQL, JSON, XML, strings, integers, all of that. At the end of the day, you are still coding, albeit by dragging and dropping. It's just much quicker. It's easier to learn than a programming language, and it's also much easier to maintain. Have you ever tried to find an issue in someone else's code? Well, that's hard. Um, next up, what are microservices? Now, I see them as simple data providers or single actions, which have a singular and specific role to provide a piece of data, which you can then consume into your own system. They are normally modular, can live independently. Um, a couple of examples of microservices would be currency converters, uh, postal code finders, etc. The whole idea is you've got an internal fountain of data and you need to allow other people to or other systems to consume it. So in essence, low code and microservices seem to be a match made in heaven, except there's a couple of uh, uh, pitfalls. To demonstrate this, let's jump straight into an example. Uh, it's a real, real world case study of something we've actually done. For background info, we've got a customer. They are quite a large shop. So we'll just call them the shop. They're a large retail shop with multiple sites, multiple buildings and products. And uh, as their core business system, they are using Sage X3. Um, and they've got all the bells and whistles in there. Now the shop approached us quite a while ago with a question, can you? Well, there it is. I love that question. Can you pull invoices from our Sage X3 system and place it into our CRM system, which is Salesforce? So that got me all excited. I had to prove I can. Sage X3, yeah, it's a complex system with a lot of different REST and SOAP connectors all over the place. Um, and most of it's custom built. It's got different standards and structures. The fields are weirdly named. 
And as a bonus, most of the documentation is French, which I really don't understand. But within a couple of days, we've de developed without any code, a solution showing them, yes, we can pull data from Sage X3. And since then, they've been using our tool for integration into the Sage X3 system, Salesforce, and the Shopify store. Um, during that process, we've built a couple of reusable low-code functions, which understands Sage X3 and can pull and push data through the REST and um, SOAP endpoints. So recently, the shop had a new request. For record keeping and regulatory requirements, they need to store all of their supplier and custom, uh, customer documentation off-site. And that's all the paper-based and electronic documents. So every delivery note, printed invoice, all of that. They identify the filing partner who fits their requirements perfectly. Just one small hitch. They need to reconcile the paper documents to their sales and receipts data. And all of this sits on the Sage X3 system. But the shop system speaks one language and the filing partner speaks a completely different language. And the systems can't talk to each other. To change in either of these systems would be a considerable cost. And neither of them have the appetite to, um, for a large customization project on their own systems. So that's where low code comes in. And also, here's the first pitfall. Because we've previously worked with them, they think, and rightly so, that low code just automatically does what it should and everything works. So their request was, we need to send invoices to SharePoint. Nice, I thought, okay, I jumped off. I started planning SharePoint libraries, SharePoint integrations, but that's not what they needed. As with normal coding, when you want to build something, um, you need to be clear of what your requirements is. What we were asked to quote on and build was not at all what they needed. I know, I know, low code promises the world. So when I talk about requirements and specifications, it really sounds counter revolutionary. It sounds like programming. So yes, the pitfall is this, even though low code is easy, fast and quick, do not skimp on the requirements because if you quickly build something completely wrong, it's still wrong. So long story short, we sat down with the shop and we spec'd out a requirements document. After discussions, we came up with these requirements. The shop needs to provide the data to the filing partner in a specific format and language which the filing partner will understand and can use. The data must be available on demand and immediately. The partner will pull the data based on a date. And then finally, the shop systems are inside of a private network, but the filing partner is uh, from outside. So it needs to still access the, the service from outside. So it took a couple of days to get these requirements finalized, but finally the fun can start. With a clear requirement, we can then set up and complete the solution for the shop. And this is really then where low code comes in and simply bedazzles everybody. Yes, low code is easy to implement, especially since you understand what the correct requirements are. Because we've previously worked on the shop systems and already have reusable functions talking with Sage, uh, we can simply call them again with different parameters and interpretations. So let's jump into an example. I'm going to use our tool called Links which is an integration and automation tool. Um, the example will be for a microservice that returns customer invoices as uh, for a requested day. At the end, we will deploy the solution to a link server and pull some example data from uh, Sage X3. Okay. Right. So to build, I'm going to start with the end in mind. First, we'll set up the response for our microservice. So we already know what the requirements are. Um, so we need, we'll create a new type, which we'll use as the response. We'll call this uh, the customer invoice. And then first things first, we need to um, set up the structure for this type. For each invoice, they are looking for the customer's company, the name, the email, invoice number, and date, but also, quite a few other fields as well. So for this uh, filing partner, this data structure is critical. At the end of the day, they also need to send the archived documents to each of the customers and they can't send the wrong documents to the wrong customer. 
So all of these fields are critical for the filing partner. Okay. Once this is done, we can just save it. Okay, once this response has been set up, we can now add the service to our project. Um, I'm going to use what we call a simple REST host. And that's just because that's what it really is. It's really simple to use. And it's perfect for microservices. We'll call our service filing API and give it a URI. And then we need to set up our operation. We'll call this operation a customer invoice. And we also need to just set up what part you will call this. It will also be customer invoice. And this will be a get service because we only want to retrieve data. Uh, there will be one parameter called date. And then the response will be a list and we'll use our customer invoice that we, we just defined as well. So we will return a list of customer invoices. Okay, that's it. So microservice is now ready to be populated with data. What we'll also do is we'll just enable documentation so we can send that to the filing partner. Okay. Right, so to get the data into our um, API, we'll use our SageX3 function that we've already defined um, called get customer info. Uh, if we look at it, you can see that we've got some fields in there. We've got class and representation and count. So these are all Sage X3 objects. Uh, we're not going to worry about them now. We've also got a page count because we need to loop through uh, the invoices in batches. The reason for it is on a good day, the shop will have over a thousand invoices. So we split it up in batches and we keep calling it until we get to the last invoice for the day. Okay. So once this function is set up, we can then run it and we can get information back from Sage. And I'm going to show you an example of how this uh, data will look. Okay, so here you can see this is the type of data that Sage sends us. So it's not very pretty and not understandable at all, but everything is in there. We just need to get it out. And remember, there can be over a thousand of these on a good day. Okay. So let's get back to our microservice. We can just call our Sage X3 function and give it a date. And we know that uh, Sage X3 will return a list of invoices back. <clears throat> so we can just easily loop through the invoices. So we get a for each and we use the invoice uh, list from our Sage X3 function. Now to map these invoices to our own uh, response, we use an add to list function. And the list is going to be the um, response for our microservice. So we just go to our results and the response is the list that we want to add it to. And then we can simply map the fields we want to use. Okay, so we'll just map each of these fields to map these fields is going to take a while, uh, but by assigning the correct ugly looking value from Sage X, X3 uh, to our nice, easy, readable structure, um, the, the filing uh, partner will be able to use them. So each time we're just going to select the correct Sage X3 fields and map it. Now, just to make this example easier, I'm not gonna filter through the invoices, but essentially we could run checks against any of these fields that Sage X3 returns. And we can decide whether the invoice should be returned or completely ignored. Again, assigning the correct field is critical for the business to make sure that we don't send the incorrect invoice to the incorrect customer. Okay. Last field, and that's it. Now we can test our new microservice uh, to see how the data looks. We need to click debug and we provide it with a date. Okay, and then by stepping through the function, we'll receive some data. And we can see, yes, uh, we've, we're getting the data and the, the data is in the correct uh, format. So sorry, my head is in the way, but we'll, we'll do a test just now. So let's push the deploy button and we are putting our microservice on the link server. 
normally the server sits in the cloud and it's got VPN access to the Sage server and an API exposed to the outside. So once this deployment is over, we can go to the server and we can just switch on our microservice. Cool. Okay, and then we can test it. So let's go to our test. Okay, rest. right. So as you can see, I'm running a test to my microservice and all of the fields are there. All the fields are nicely formatted, list in all of the correct uh, formats and yeah, you can actually read it. Sorry, I had to blur the fields there because those are real data from the customer. And now we can let the shop and the filing partner know that all of the, that they can start using the microservice. Now, how would they know how to use it? And that's the nice thing. It automatically uh, publishes an API reference document. And the, the filing partner can just use this and connect to the service. And also they can download the open API JSON file and uh, import it into their own system if they want to use it that way. Okay. So this whole process took only what, 10 minutes? So of course, um, we already had the Sage X3 function and I've got a lot of experience using this tool, but the value for the customer was realized immediately. The real life solution from start to end took a couple of hours to build and put live. And that brings us to the next low code pitfall. How much can you really charge a customer for two hours of work, which normally would have taken weeks of coding, integration testing, going live, etc.? Well, I really don't know. And uh, um, I'm asking <laughs> how much. I don't have an answer for this <clears throat> just yet. So our final thoughts on low code and microservices. Yes, they are a good match. In this day and age, content is <clears throat> sorry, a really valuable asset. By using low code and APIs and microservices, you can convert your asset into true value for your company. Low code and microservices architectures both aim to improve agility and software development. Understanding the customer, the requirements and their environment that is where the value lies. That is where the traditional developer's experience, mindset, and skill comes to infect. That is what a customer pays for at the end. So to reiterate, don't skimp on the requirements and for yourself determine what you can charge for a customer for the work. Even though it only took a couple of hours, it's your skills and expertise that they are pay paying for. Thank you, Bo. All right, thank you, Davi. Yeah, really interesting overview of uh, some of the common hangups of maintaining one of these sort of platforms and awesome proof of concept for generating a microservice from scratch um, within just a 10 minute time frame. That's that's cool. Um, what, what do you think would uh, would be required to get something like that um, production ready? Because uh, is there anything else you would be needing to consider? Well, if I look at the example I just did, yeah. compared to the real world project that went into production, the only difference is where we added a bit of authorization. So not anybody can call right. it. And, um, and that was pretty much that. I think we did two microservices for the customer in two hours um, and we just put it live. So it was production ready and the user could have used it immediately and start getting value out of it. 